to welcome you here this morning. As I said to Peggy when she came in, she was an icon in the domestic violence field when I started 15 years ago, and she's still with us, still with Peace Over Violence, and we are so thrilled, Peggy, to welcome you here with us this morning. So please join me in welcoming Peggy Wynn. Um, two things are true, I'm old, and the second one is that you can hear me in New York. <laughs>
used to have Mark to do this when we're in meetings. We have mobility disabilities. We have sensory disabilities. What else? We have cognitive disabilities. Let me think of something else. Really hot, 
not so hot that it left marks, just enough to make it uncomfortable. And then he would take the washcloth and he would get it wet and twist it like this and thick her in the face and on her body with it, which would, of course, cause stinging pain on her body, but not leave a single mark. So when we think about mobility, tell me some of the causes of mobility disabilities. Well, we just said that one, cerebral palsy. But let's talk about cerebral palsy. And what is the difference between cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis, muscular dystrophy, dystrophy, et cetera, et cetera? Not that much to the general public, but it's important really for us to look at this. If we think about a person who has cerebral palsy, do we immediately, or muscular dystrophy, multiple sclerosis, whatever, do we immediately think about a person who uses an electric chair? Or do we recognize, it's so important to recognize that illnesses or diseases like cerebral palsy are progressive, okay? So the person who starts with cerebral palsy has this much of a mobility disability, okay? And then as they begin to get older, whatever things happen in their life, that increases and they become less and less mobile. When we think about domestic violence in addition, in addition to that, you want to look at how that could exacerbate or make that disease worsen quicker, right? So um, there's many ways that that can happen, but one of them is, is the battery. If someone knocks you around, throws you down, um, pushes you off the bed, knocks you over when you're using your walker, whatever, those things will cause your body to respond in such a way that the illness will grow. I once read a great book that talked about battered women and physical illnesses and the connection to them. And there is very definitely connection, so I say that. So if you think about that, I will tell you the story about this young woman, beautiful young woman who was diagnosed with cerebral palsy actually when she was 11 years old. She had kind of a crooked gait to her walk but that was really all, was that off balance kind of walk that she had. And she met a young man in school and they fell in love and he proposed to her. And she tried to explain to him very clearly about cerebral palsy and the progression of cerebral palsy. And, and his whole thing to her was, I don't care, I love you. It's gonna be just fine. So her parents agreed and they got married. Well, not too long after they got married, she became pregnant. Pregnancy and cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis, muscular dystrophy, etc., do not go well together. Okay, that's what. So it doesn't really mean that a person with cerebral palsy can't be a great mom, but it does mean that having that child is going to speed up the progression of her disease. So, the, of course, the more pregnant she became, <laughs> Is there such a thing as being a little bit pregnant? Yes, there is. That's what it does. It show you. What did you say here? Um, I I just wanted to clarify something because I I actually have CP myself. Okay. And um, CP is not a disease. Okay. Actually, it's not a progressive um, problem. It's a condition that starts in the brain. But what can, you almost have it correct. What can happen is when because CP is based on um, from brain damage and muscular things can happen and right. it makes it uh, difficult to move. As you get older, especially, um, I'll speak for myself, um, um, because I'm kind of a mixed type, but I do have a lot of spasticity, the spasticity gets worse. Right. So if, so, so if you get older and then you have an abuser, it can exacerbate the the feeling of tightness because you need more time to recover from whatever happens. But it's not like a fatal disease. Right, I, I, okay. I really didn't mean that either. Because okay. you know, we have these weird terms and you never know. Yeah. I have a, 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 pro, a problem called Sjogren's Syndrome. My doctor refers to it as a disease. I hate that word myself, but yeah. you know. Um, so you say it's a problem, it's an issue that I have. So that's, that's a very really good thing. And that's the other thing is when you said, I'll speak for myself. Yeah. So individual. 
CP is so, it is. Amazing. It is. And just because this person has cerebral palsy and this person has cerebral palsy doesn't mean that there's any real connection right. to where they are in mobility or right. in function. I have a wonderful client, one of my favorite clients actually, who when she first called me up on the phone and said to me, first she said her name and then she said, I have cerebral palsy, I am not retarded. Exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> One of the things that people do, and that's another kind of abuse, is to assume that the person who has less control of their motor movements don't have control of their brain and can't think right. Not mm -hmm. true, okay? So, to, to go back to the story about this young woman, she got pregnant, she had a child, and that, through that, exacerbated her CP mm -hmm to the point that after the child was born, she was no longer able to walk by herself, even with a cane or a crutch. So she started with using arm crutches, but that really made it difficult for her to work with her child. So she went to a wheelchair in order to have her arms available to take care of the baby. Then her husband picked her up to put her in the bathtub and dropped her, broke her left leg. Of course, that caused more problems. The healing time in there is really long. So eventually she moved from that to an electric chair and having to have full-time personal care attendant who was also her husband, who then, of course, started to abuse her. And what might be, you tell me if you can, some of the ways that he abused her that we would not normally think about as being domestic violence. What are the, okay. Not charging the chair, not charging the battery, so she was. Still. On a regular basis. Right. Okay. What else? Uh, I would think limiting access to her child. Yeah. Like, oh, big time. Big time. Started telling her, no, 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 it's not safe for you to hold the baby, you might drop the baby. And as the child got older, started moving into being a toddler, etc., less and less contact with mom. What else? not giving her the basic things in life that people, you know, food, clothing, you know, taking care of the showers, bathing. <clears throat> That's a big one. Neglect is a huge part of domestic violence with people with all disabilities. The neglect of their personal needs, not being willing to provide that, or only providing that when you're happy with them. So one of the things that he did, of course, was to withhold from her her physical therapy. She was supposed to go every week for physical therapy, but he postponed that or he would cancel at the last minute and more, less and less and less often was she allowed to go to physical therapy. So what happens if you don't go to physical therapy? Your body doesn't function as well. It loses more and more ability of its ability to function because you're not doing something to make it work. You all know, I don't know if you know that, but I'll tell you that if you go home and you become a couch potato, pretty soon you won't have the strength or the ability to not be a couch potato. In order to have good movement in our bodies, we have to move our bodies. So um, withholding physical therapy was a big thing. Not allowing her to go to a doctor or to where she could talk to people about what was happening in her home. Isolation. One of the ways that he isolated her is that he moved her to Emmett. So a uh, very, very far. Physical therapy at UCLA now became impossible to get her there. And he used that as an excuse. So little by little, he took away from her her child. He took away from her her independence. He took away from her her ability to make decisions for herself. But he never laid a hand on her. Not once. He never hit her. He never left bruises on her. He did nothing that we could evidence as domestic violence. One day he put her in the car, in the van, they had a van, he put her in the van and the child who was by this time seven years old in the van and they went to the mall. And as they always did when they went to the mall, he dropped her off at the door with her chair, right? And he went to park, oh guess what? He didn't come back. He took the child and he left. 
and he left her in the mall with no way to get home, no key to her house, no money, no way to do anything except be stranded there, and he took her child. And he moved to someplace else, to Costa Mesa, with the child. And when we went to court and we called it domestic violence, the judge at the court in Hammond told us what? I see no evidence of violence here. Because there was no bruises, no history of police reports, no nothing to say that he had committed domestic violence against her. So what is the next big thing that happens in that case, do you think? The abuser got custody of the child because mom has a disability, right? right? Mm -hmm. And the judge says, this parent's a better parent because he doesn't have a disability, okay? Mm -hmm. And then when mom wants visitation of the child, more than one week in the month, the judge tells her, if you want to see your child more often, you need to move closer to your child. It took us almost two years, actually, to be able to find housing for her that she could afford on the amount of money that you live on when you have a disability. And to get her moved, we were able to do that. Eventually, we were able to get her every single weekend with her child. We were never able to help her regain full custody of her child. So one of the common themes that we see, really, is that People who have disabilities are less likely to be awarded custody of their children, and they're less likely to be believed because the type of abuse that happens to them is not what we generally think about when we're talk thinking about or talking about domestic violence issues. Isolation truly is the key to domestic violence, whether you have a disability or you don't. But if you have a, a disability, especially if it's a mobility disability, isolation is really simple to achieve. And so it is the number one tool used by the abuser is to keep you from being able to access services, to have friends and family help you. One of the problems is that even though I know we all know we have the ADA, right? But the ADA only is a law, and people actually, in America at least, only obey the laws they like. Okay? That is true fact. Anybody think that's not true? Good. That is a true fact. We only obey the laws we like, and that even includes law enforcement. And law enforcement, even though training, and let's not say that's every single one, but it's still a true fact, are less likely to support the person with a disability than the abuser if the abuser does not have a disability. But let me ask you this question. Do you think that if two people are partnered and they both have disabilities, there could still be domestic violence? Yes. Oh, absolutely. And sometimes how it's addressed by law enforcement or by judges and prosecution can be really strange. One time, many years back, we had two clients, or had a client, but the, her abuser was also in a wheelchair, and the judge actually told them, told her he would not give her a restraining order, but he separated the apartment. I guess he thought he was Solomon. He said, when you go home, you are to have this side of the house, and you are to have this side of the house. I'm like, excuse me, judge, this side of the house has the bathroom. <laughs> this side of the house has the kitchen. <laughs> His order was that they were not to use their wheelchairs, either one of them, after 8 o'clock at night. Hello? What, do you stop being disabled after 8 p.m.? <laughs> so it's really, you know, I, you know, it sounds funny, but when you think about it, you think how about that person that's in front of the judge expecting some justice and some help, and what they get instead is someone who has not the foggiest idea what disability means. Now I know, I mean, we're very limited in time, so I agree that everyone, okay. So, sensory disability not including deafness means what? Visual impairment. Visual impairment, okay, blindness. 
Blindness is actually one of my favorite topics, and it's because for the last 19 years, I have been doing adapted self-defense training with the Braille Institute. And I know hundreds of people who are blind or visually impaired. And one of the first things that I learned about people who are blind is that they all know it. And they're not afraid of the word blind. It's just fine to say that. I have a, a client who um, has a type of blindness that includes disattachment of her retina. And she can only see in like little squares, okay? Tiny little squares, like the size of your thumb. So when she first came to see me, she asked me if she could look at me. And I, I've worked with blind people for a long time, so I really thought she just wanted to feel what I look like or whatever, no. She wanted to look at me, I'm gonna use Marcy because I know she doesn't care. So she gets up to me and she looks at me like this. Little tiny parts of my face, right? So that she was examining what I was, what I looked like. And when she was all done, she said to me, Miss Peggy, I think you must be very beautiful. And I called her by her name and I said, Miss Blake, I think you must be blind. <laughs> and after she just cracked up and we kind of were able to move forward from there. <laughs> Blindness, while it is a sensory disability, is a huge mobility disability. So we need to know that these two things can be connected, right? They can be connected big time. If you were the abuser of a person who was blind, what might be the very first thing you would do? Take away their cane. <laughs> there you go. Take away the cane. Now, I don't know, how many people here if you actually, do you know that a blind person's cane is actually a legal document? Okay? Therefore, it is not easily achievable. So I'm going to tell you, I, I like to tell stories about what happened. So I'll tell you about this particular client, same one. When she first called me, she said to me on the phone, this is what happened to me. I got married. Three weeks later, the person that I married threw me across the room and down a flight of stairs, and I broke my neck. Oh. I went into the hospital, I had surgery, I left the hospital, I went to a women's shelter, or into a convalescent home, I left convalescent into a women's shelter, and the women's shelter sent me from the state that I lived in to California, and the agency that they connected me with placed me in an apartment in Los Angeles. And here I am in this city that I've never been in before, and I don't have a cane. Mm. So I said, well, did you call the Braille Institute? She said, yes. And this is what they told me. You come from a different state. And before I can give you a cane, I need to have certification that you are blind. And so we will set you up with a doctor's appointment in three weeks. And the doctor will fill out the form and send it to the Braille Institute. And the Braille Institute will contact you and will give you a cane, right? In the meantime, she doesn't know how to get to a bus, where, really where she is, anything about what she's doing. Fortunately, the people that helped her move gave her my name and phone number to call us to get services. So I asked her, of course, first question I asked her after that is how tall are you, right? Wrote that down, called the Braille Institute. Oh, I did just say I've been working there a long time with people at the Braille Institute. So I got on the phone, I called the Braille Institute, I said to my contact, I have a new client whose abuser destroyed her cane. I don't actually know if that's what happened to the cane. <laughs> Nobody really knows what happened to the cane. Somewhere in all that movement, it got knocked in her. But I said the abuser destroyed her cane, and she needs a cane, she's five foot six. And my contact said, well, come get it, Peggy. So I got in my car. I drove to the Braille Institute, I got the cane. I go, drove to the client's apartment and knocked on her door, said, this is Peggy from Peace Over Violence, I have a cane for you. So she opened the door, oh, she was so excited. She said, oh, come in, come in, come in. I said, oh, no, I can't do that. I'm not allowed to come in your house, here's your cane. Call me for an appointment. So it was after that she came to see me. So there again, when you take away the cane, what is the first thing that that means they did to her? 100% isolation. 
You can't go anywhere if you don't have that. It is a fallacy, people's thought, that people who are blind automatically have dogs. Less than 30%, okay? Expensive thing to have a, a dog. Even though ADA says that you cannot tell me that I can't have the dog, you can charge me a $400 deposit for the dog. Yeah, and they do. Not only that, that person has to have some place to take the dog to do its business and the ability to clean up after it. So what if the person who uses the dog also uses a chair? Is that something the personal care attendant's gonna do for her? So you think about that. Blindness and visual impairment comes in many different ways, and so there's a lot of different things um, that can be done. So let's talk about a particular type of vision loss that causes tunnel vision. Tunnel vision is when you actually lose the peripheral vision. Sometimes I tell people, if you put your hand by the side of your face, right in front of your ear, you can see your hand. If you cannot, you need to see an ophthalmologist, okay? When, when that begins to get smaller and smaller and smaller until you can only see like this, you see that vision going away, you have tunnel vision. Tunnel vision is caused by many things, but the two primary ones are glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy. <coughs> if a person has tunnel vision, they can't see what's coming at them from the side. So one of the clients that I had said that what happened with her is that she lived in a two-story house, and when she would come from the bedroom downstairs, her abuser would tiptoe up behind her on the stairs, and when she so that she wouldn't know he was there and go, could have got you that time. She became so terrified that she started by coming down the stairs, holding onto the side and walking them this way so that she had a hold of the banner on both sides, uh -huh. and eventually quit sleeping upstairs. She was afraid to sleep upstairs. She was afraid to walk down the stairs for fear, not that he would push her, but that he would startle her and she would lose her balance and fall, okay? So that, that's a different kind of abuse. Again, it's not about physically punching her, knocking her around, whatever, right? What other kind of disability could be a, a sensory disability that you think people don't hear about so much? <clears throat> think about your senses. Sensory disabilities include the inability to taste, the inability to smell, and the inability to feel. And so if part of your body, or all of your body for that matter, but if part of your body can't feel if someone sticks pins in you, then sticking pins in you is something that someone could do as part of just abusing you, right? So you just, really when you're thinking about disabilities, you want to think about what that disability entails and what would be the way that someone could abuse them without leaving evidence of physical violence. That's really important thing. In America, there is a fallacy that no one would ever hurt someone with a disability. Anybody ever hear that? <laughs> oh, nobody would ever hurt someone with a disability. But the actual fact is that persons with disabilities are twice as likely to be abused as persons without disabilities. Persons with disabilities are far more likely, almost 10 times as likely, to be repeatedly abused over and over and over by different family members, caretakers, friends, whoever, okay? So, um, yes? Um, how is the, uh, the adoption services are they trained in this? What is their response? I have to say I really hate it when people ask me that question. <laughs> okay. Sorry. But, well, but, but I have, guess I have to answer it by my opinion, right? So let me say that that is my opinion. Adult protective services very often shows up, knocks on the door, says, are you okay? Is somebody abusing you? No? Okay, I'll go home now. Okay. Um, I, I see you saying right. Okay, so, all right. So the whole thing about adult protective services is like any other agency, there are those who really work hard at their job and there are those who don't. 
but the fact is that Adult Protective Services, as a standalone agency, has no power. If they go to the door and the person who opens the door does not want to let them in, they do not have to let them in, they are not the police. While they can file a report that they think something's happening, they can't do a thing about it. They don't write restraining orders. They don't pre provide safe housing. They don't really provide nonviolent counseling, okay? More than anything, they really look at people who have um, pretty severe disabilities and elders, elder abuse and more in hospitals, convalescent homes than in home. And so um, I can say that through the years we've tried many times to partner with Adult Protective <coughs> Services have never really had a lot of luck there, okay? That's what, so it, obviously it's gonna depend on the agency in the area where you are, but that's, that's what they, the, to me I, I do better if I just go straight forward with addressing it through a domestic violence based agency or, or then through law enforcement, right? And if you come, if I went to the door, I couldn't get in either, but see, here's the difference, I'll bring a police officer with me, right? Okay, so then we'll see if we can get something going on there, so that's what. If a person has a sensory disability, that means that they can't really taste their food, how, is, how easy is it to feed them food that's not good for them? food that is old or spoiled or or whatever okay so really i'm saying take a look at the disability and think about the type of abuse that could happen to them okay so then if we go to cognitive disability what is a cognitive disability Mental retardation. it could be but isn't that the extreme of it and one of the things yeah. it's just like when i said what is mobility and we meant immediately to chair right Cognitive disability could be this. I have a learning disability. I have dyslexia, okay? Um, what, some Like dementia? Sure, but dementia's more here, and you know, dementia's really a, primarily either an old age or drug problem, okay? So when we, really when we talk about cognitive disabilities, it has to do simply with the brain and the ability to break, for the brain to fu function at what level and what speed. So you can have a cognitive disability and just be a slow learner. You can have a cognitive disability, as I said, and just have dyslexia, but you can have a cognitive disability that meant that you were severely developmentally disabled, unable to make decisions for yourself, etc. So anywhere in that range, I saw you raised your hand. I was gonna say you could just become easily confused. You could just become easily confused. Cognitive disabilities also are very often um, exacerbated by other type of disability that adds to it. So right now I'm thinking about a particular one called dysphagia. Does anyone know what dysphagia is? Yes? But it's a cognitive disability. Because what actually happens with dysphagia is that what's in the brain can't come out here. Right. Okay? So, marvelous young woman, actually from Northern California, who was brought here to see me because of an issue that she had. She was actually raped in a hotel by a hotel worker. And, um, when she came to talk to me, I, I met with her and I sat down with her and I already knew that she had dysphagia. I had already been told that she had dysphagia. But we sat down to talk and I sat and I just listened. And she was talking and telling me the story about what happened and all of a sudden in the middle of it she said to me, I like you. And I said, why do you like me? She said, because you shut up. Now what do you think she meant? <laughs> that I didn't interrupt her because people who have dysphagia, um, well, you know, you know, people who have dysphagia, well, you know, talk like that, okay? And they can't seem to get it out. And so when they get that quiet, uh, uh, people want to put the word in there for them. So mm -hmm. one of the things that happens if a person has that kind of a disability, any kind of a speech, 
communication disability, whatever kind it is, really limits their ability to report and to be taken seriously. One of the problems is if the police officer wants to ask you a question and you respond and then they want to ask you another question, if you have many different types of cognitive disabilities, but including dysphagia, you can't do that. You have to tell the story from beginning to end. And if anybody interrupts you, you have to start back at the beginning and tell the story from beginning to end. There are also people who use various communication devices, be they electronic, computer-like, or soft technology, low uh, Yes, communication boards and whatever. Yes. Yeah. And In the old those, days before we had these wonderful right. voice-activated computers, I had a client in, in our self-defense program that had a voice uh, voice board, communication board, and I actually recorded on it for her when we were teaching self-defense. So when she hit this button, it said, get away from me! <laughs> well, since she got the lady talk, yes, it really startled people. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. But if those devices are not maintained or not available, or I talk to parents who say, oh yeah, it broke a long time ago, about last year, and you haven't had it repaired. And that youngster that has no what? ability to speak. That is domestic violence. It's abuse. And, and we need to really recognize that abuse is not about punching someone in the face. Abuse is really, truly about removing from that person any hope of a better tomorrow. That's what, every single time, okay. So cognitive disabilities, again, range at many, many, many levels, okay? And what we need to know is that regardless of whether it's that person who has that little minor, I'm a slow learner, or that person who has a huge, huge problem trying to tell you, I was a victim of rape, but I really don't know. When you're listening, you know they don't know if it happened in 1902 or 1922 or whatever because they all get mixed up. Part of the reason for that is the cognitive disability, mm -hmm. but the other part of the reason for that is this is the group of people that has the most likelihood of abuse from beginning to end of life. Mm, wow. 10 times as likely as a person who is viewed as able-bodied. 10 times as likely. And to be repeatedly both sexually and physically abused. They are the group most likely to be targeted for hate crimes against persons with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So if you think that no one would ever hurt with someone with a disability, let me say this to you again. You need to rethink what happens in this world. For those who would abuse others are those who look for the most vulnerable people to abuse. Yes, ma'am. Peggy, is it because of their lack of ability to report all these things? Absolutely. Absolutely, okay. number one issue mm -hmm. is that if your vulnerability is such that it's difficult for you to get response from law enforcement, if it's difficult for you to tell your story, it's hard for people to talk to you, sure. right? Then you are the most vulnerable and therefore the most likely to be abused, okay? Hidden disabilities. Somebody tell me what is a hidden disability? <clears throat> Epilepsy. Good job, any seizure disorder, mm -hmm. yes? Unless you're in seizure, right? What else? Heart problems. Say again? Heart problems. If you have heart problems, yes? Diabetes. Diabetes, yes. What else? Cancer? Hidden disability, unless you just went through chemo and all your hair fell out, right? Okay, or if you had know someone who's been through cancer and you can tell it from looking at their eyes, okay? AIDS? Anybody in this room have back issues? Mm -hmm. wow. Hidden disability except for the day that you have it. Okay, and I'm gonna list some other ones for you. Remember I said I have a health problem called Sjogren's Syndrome. Right. Sjogren's Syndrome is known as the dry lupus. It is a type of lupus. There are a few types of lupus, okay? And um, that includes fibromyalgia, mm -hmm. chronic fatigue syndrome. All of those are hidden disabilities except when you're in flare. So if you have a disability that comes in flare, in my case, 
I can be where I can hardly move. I've actually been out of work, off work for a few days because I had a huge flare and my left shoulder swelled up like the size of a baseball and I couldn't move. So I can only get it this high right now. But I promise you I can tell from that that I'm on the mend. By Saturday I can teach self-defense. <laughs> so yeah, there it is. So do I have a disability? Yes. Sometimes, right? Do I not have a disability? Like, okay, so there it is. So <laughs> hidden disabilities are really those that others can't see and that can be big time used against you. And so one of the things I would say with that to you is this, if you see someone get out of their car and put a disabled placard on their car and they walk across the street, do not assume that they can walk blocks and blocks and blocks, maybe and maybe not. Yes, I know there's a lot of abuse of disabled stickers. I have a disabled placard. When I came here this morning, did I park in disability? Heck no. And as a matter of fact, I never do. Even when I'm in major flare, I never do. But I use it to park out in front of my office or in front of some place that I'm going on days when I'm having a hard time walking. When it's not an issue, I don't use it at all. Okay? But I, you know, I know people who tell me, you have a disabled placard park right there. Not on a bed. Right? No. So it is really about hidden disabilities are just about disabilities that you can't see and you don't know that person has until she says so or he says so, right? Couldn't a learning disability I'll, I'll be seen too as a um as a hidden disability? Exactly, yeah. and that's why I put another connector right here. We're always connecting. Okay. Because guess what? Somehow they all connect. Yeah. Absolutely. My partner of many years who um, died from cancer in 2006 had a learning disability. She had dyslexia really bad. Mm -hmm. She grew up in a family who um, did not have her diagnosed with dyslexia and, and who just told her she was stupid. And when I tried to talk her into going back to school, her family, her mother actually said to her, you're not smart enough to go to school. Oh, oh I was so happy that her mama said that because one thing I'll tell you for sure is Sharon was rebellious from tip to toe. Okay? <laughs> um, what? The next day, she registered for school. If she'd have got the same encouragement from her mother that I was giving her, she might never have gone. But she went back to school as an adult in her early 40s and she graduated at the age of 43 from high school valedictorian of her class and went on to Long Beach City College where she earned an AA degree in social work and a certificate then in social services and I was just very proud of her for doing that and guess what so was her mother so when she graduated and she's in cap and gown who is it that was standing right next to her this is my daughter the mother who told her she wasn't smart enough to go to school so a lot of times, um, our disabilities, whatever they are, are really as intense only as we let them be, as mm -hmm. other people make us feel that they are. So one of the ways to abuse people with disabilities is just to remind them that they can't do that. Very, very briefly, I will tell you a little story about a young man who had a developmental disability. I worked with him. Many years ago, I worked at the Long Beach Police Department. And as a second job, I worked in a group home just trying to teach independent living skills. And this young man said to me, I want a job. And I said, but in order to have a job, you have to be able to take the bus and read the bus signs and get yourself there and get yourself back. And he simply could not seem to learn to read. And he said to me one day, Peggy, you know I'm never going to learn to read because I'm retarded. And I said to him, who told you that? And he said, your mom, my mom. Well, I couldn't say your mom's a liar, okay? So I said, but you know, did she tell you that it's only your brain that's retarded? Let's try something else. Let's teach your fingers to read. And he said, what? Let's teach your fingers to read because they don't know that you're retarded. So I taught him to finger spell and to finger spell the words and we would go on the bus and he would finger spell the words on the bus until he knew where to get off. And so when he went to take the test for his job, he said to me before he left, if I ask my fingers, is that cheating? 
And I said, no, it's not. And so he would look at it and he would finger spell the word and write it. Because his fingers never forgot, right? So sometimes it's really about just telling someone you can do this or you can't do this. So, okay. Mental disabilities to me have to do with mental illness. That includes dementia, Alzheimer's, whatever. And this is what I would like to say to you. I don't know a darn thing about mental illness. <laughs> and every single time that it's brought to the, the floor of disabilities, I have to say, that's just not my subject. I don't know anything about mental illness. And um, I do know that people who have mental illness are most certainly abused but I know that I seldom see them unless the mental illness is at, at a level that, that that's not the primary issue, okay? So I don't want to talk about mental illness, but I do want to talk about deafness, and I think I have 10 minutes, right? Okay. So let's talk deaf. Okay. <laughs> oh my goodness. Deafness like disability comes in many, many levels, okay? It's not an absolute. No one hears silence. You have tinnitus, you have different sounds happening in your ears, and you have a level of hearing measured in decibels. But for the benefit of this pr presentation, let's talk about a person whose hearing loss is severe enough that they can't just pick up the phone and call the police department. Number one, okay? So how does that person communicate? Most often with sign language, but not all. It's really important for us to recognize that in this country, as in many countries, there are choices. In this country, you have a lot of choices of education. For many years, for well over 100 years, almost every single child that was diagnosed as deaf was sent away to a deaf school, okay? Every state has a deaf school. California has two, Northern California, Southern California, right? And so the deaf community is very small and insular, and the deaf community is its own community. It's its own culture. They have their own language, they have their own cultural clubs, they have their own Olympics, right? Mm -hmm. Many, many things, and they use American Sign Language. Before someone asks me, I will tell you no. American Sign Language is not universal. American Sign Language is taught here in America. English Sign Language is taught in England. Okay? French Sign Language is taught in France. And many countries, especially underdeveloped countries, so for the sake of um, who we serve the most frequently, talk about those people who come here as immigrants from underdeveloped countries. Guatemala, Mexico, El Salvador, Ecuador, on and on. Do not have education programs for deaf. True yeah. And so, they learn to communicate basically by home signs. And we have a, a, a saying that has really talked about the deaf child being the family pet and being treated like a family pet. And I'll kind of give you a vision of that. Say today is Thanksgiving and the whole family's coming. Only one person in that family is deaf. And so as people come in, they come up to the, her and they pat her on the shoulder, say, hi, how are you? You doing good? End of communication. Right. Because in America today, still 90%, that is nine out of 10 children who are born deaf are born to hearing parents who have absolutely no knowledge of deafness, of deaf culture, and who learn to sign 150 words by the time that child is 18 years old. The average hearing parent of a deaf child in America still does not learn to communicate with that child. And even if they send them to a school where they learn sign language, no one in their home, in their family, 
no sign language. Deaf children fit in this group, not because the deafness has a thing to do with their brain, okay, but because they are perceived as mm -hmm. being that old term deaf and dumb, mm -hmm. deaf and mute. They are perceived as being unable to tell, unable to get response and have anything done about it. Even today, if you go into a school, if you go to Riverside to the school for the deaf, and you say to a child in the third grade, if someone touched you in the wrong place, who would you tell? And the child will raise their hand and say, my mom, right? I say, oh, good. Does your mom sign? Yes, sir. No. Would she understand what you were saying? No. Ah, then, who can you tell that will understand and help you, right? Okay. So it's a really important thing to recognize that communication and lack of communication is that huge key. For lack of communication is the biggest isolator of all. Still today, we have this huge problem. In Bell Gardens, six weeks ago, a young woman who is a client of mine was punched in the face hit across the top of the head with a bottle, had 11 stitches in her head. The police in Bell Gardens came to her home, three of them, one male, two women. Her abuser is a hearing person, I should tell you that. She has two children, an 11-year-old and a five-year-old. They took the 11-year-old with them with the mom and had the 11-year-old interpret for the mother about what happened. Okay, this young woman is an immigrant to this country and her visa has expired. So we're trying to get her a new visa. That means that we need to go back to the police who showed up at her house and get them to sign certification that she's a victim of domestic violence. Guess what happens when we call? There's no police report. There is a report that's called an incident report that says they showed up at the house but it says on it that the mother said she didn't want to file charges. Now, who actually said that? The 11 year old little boy who didn't want his daddy to go to jail said that his mom said no. We're talking about right now, not years ago, but right now. Services for persons who are deaf are so difficult. When you go to court to get a restraining order for a person who is deaf, there is not an interpreter provided for that person to write the restraining order and submit it. Once they get that order for a hearing, and they get, then there is an interpreter provided for the hearing. But now that, before that hearing, they have, if they have to be ordered by the judge to go to mediation, guess what? They're told to bring their own interpreter. How many of you happen to know that ASL interpreters cost $75 an hour? Exactly. And you can't have one for an hour. Even if your mediation meeting is only 45 minutes, guess what? You have to pay the interpreter for two hours. That's the requirement to get them. People say to us all the time, why don't you use volunteers? Because who wants to volunteer to, interp to do that interpreting? There's someone who says, oh, I took a sign language class once. I know how to sign A, B, C, D. They can't anyway. No. You have to have a certified interpreter, okay? <coughs> That's the law. We made that a law for a reason. It's because that person needs that. But you see, if the police show up at the house, and they have to wait an hour or two hours to get the interpreter, they're not going to do that. They're supposed to do that, but very often they don't do that. In the smaller um, incorporated towns that have their own police department, it is more likely that they'll use interpreters, have the child interpret. Have the hearing abuser do the interpreting. Oh yes, we have that one too, right? So if you were just 
a person who was abusing your partner who was deaf, what would be the <coughs> number one thing that, would, that you would want to do to make sure that they couldn't get help? Limit. What? Limit the uh, people around them that interpret. Limit people around them who can actually talk to them in, in American Sign Language or have a disability, whether you're deaf, blind, or whatever the issue is. Always, isolation is the key to disability. I will send the handout on disabilities in the email immediately so you get that. Thank you all so very much. other physical disabilities, so that's one, right? It's one of the disabilities we give to ourselves. Absolutely, it counts. All of them count. Is it also considered a hidden disability? <coughs> Alcoholism? Oh, yes. At least for a long, long time. Do you have a sorry for what Oh, absolutely. We have video phones. Um, I know. I don't think I have the video phone number on there, but I do have on my business card our video phones for our office, so I'll be happy to give you that. Everyone has Sorensen. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, yes. You know, when I was a young person, and oh my gosh, that was so long ago. But when I was a young person, science fiction was that we were going to be able to sit down and call someone and see them and talk to them. And guess what? I do it every day. <laughs> love it. I just love it. Any other questions? Thank you so much for your attention.